Hey guys, Dennis here, I'm with Terry. And here we're doing a Collider Mailbag. This is the show where we take your viewer submitted questions and we answer them here on this show or on our daily movie talk show. How do you get your question in? You send us an email at collidervideo at gmail.com and we'll pick them out and talk about them. Uh, how are you doing today? I'm Perry. pretty happy right uh, now. Yeah, I see you're wearing a shirt. Uh, There's no reason at all no that I'm wearing wear this shirt. shirt. Okay. I really am just so happy you gave me an excuse to wear this t-shirt. <laughs> and you'll, you, you guys will hear about uh, that on uh, one of the later questions. But let's start off with the first one. We have JB and he writes, Hello Collideroites. I watch everything you guys put out. Can't get enough. As studios continue to churn out TV to movie translations, it got me thinking of my cult favorites I'd love to see on the big screen. On my list, The Mighty Heroes, Special Unit 2, and The Misfits of Science. What would make your list? I am a Nickelodeon child. Okay. I am a 90s Nickelodeon kid. I'm getting approval from Joey behind the camera right now. So the first thing that came to my mind is I want an Are You Afraid of the Dark movie and I want it like a horror anthology. I want it to be short stories kind of like the show was and I want to see it in film format because really we don't get enough horror anthologies and I know some of them are better than others because part of the problem with the anthology format is, you know, you get X amount of stories and sometimes one is just so good that it winds up overshadowing the others, maybe even more so than they deserve. But it is a great format when it's used well and it's really used well in VHS too. I don't think we're going to ever get an Are You Afraid of the Dark style horror anthology along the lines of a VHS too. But to make something like that that could appeal to both kids and adults, mm -hmm. that could be a lot of fun. Yeah, what else do you got there? Oh, you, you're checking out the rest yeah, of my yeah, list. Yeah, yeah. So the second thing I had on my list is I love Ren and Stimpy. Yeah. I don't think that that cartoon could ever in a million years exist the same way it did back then today. I could maybe see it on, you know, brushing up alongside a South Park, something where it is explicitly stated that this show is not for children. I was a young, young kid growing up on all of that nonsense. And still to this day, I think about the, the one episode where Ren gets his teeth pulled mm -hmm. and you see the nerves and it really scares me. I, part of me thinks that that's where my fear of the dentist came from. But I do want a brand new R-rated Ren and Stimby feature film. You should watch Rick and Morty. I know, I it, know. It's an adult you know cartoon what's funny that is has kind of a, it's not exactly, obviously it's not exactly a Corinna Stimpy, but definitely, it's definitely an adult. It did cross my mind and I really did make an effort. For some reason I was under the impression that some of the episodes were on Netflix and I did look it up mm -hmm. with the intent to download some episodes and it wasn't there, but I, I promise I, I, I will seek it I out. I have season one on Blu-ray that I can look Okay, I, I'll take it. Okay. If you if you bring that in, I will watch okay, it. Cool. Okay, cool. It's a quick watch. We have a deal. All okay. right. I'm in. Uh, what else you got? You want my last one? Yeah, yeah. Salute your shorts. I <laughs> love camp stuff. I used to love that show. And really, we don't have enough fun-loving camp movies. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of things. You know, we'll get like a new Friday the 13th or something like that. But I'm thinking about things that I used to watch as a kid. Like one of my favorites was always Camp Nowhere. You ever mm -hmm. see that movie? It's a, it's a lot of fun about kids making their own camp. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I just love the camp setting and I loved that cast of characters. And I think that's totally suitable for the big screen format now. Yeah, I watched a little bit because I'm, I'm older than you. So my Nickelodeon era was different than yours. And so I did catch Ren and Stimpy and I did catch Loot Your Shorts, but it was kind of on, you know, on the tail end of watching Nickelodeon. What was your show? Oh, I don't know. I watch like Double Dare. I watch Double Dare. Yeah, but I watch the earlier incarnation okay. of Double Dare. <laughs> like, um, oh, you can't do that on television. Yeah, no, I, I didn't uh, watch that. So that was the earlier. But uh, Salute Your Shorts, I met, uh, what was that guy's name on the show? I think his name was like Donkey Lips. Donkey Lips. I met him like, like maybe <laughs> 10 years ago. Ten years ago at a party. I would love to meet him. Yeah. I, I'd be like that weird fan if I ever bumped into him. Yeah, yeah. So um, mine would be actually more, these are, like the ones he mentioned, Mighty Heroes, Special Unit 2, Misfits, I, I don't recognize any of them. Do you recognize any of those shows? Honestly, I Googled them all. Okay. So are, are, I, are, what I'm kind of a, shows are they? I'm, I, I could never give you a really uh, in-depth okay. description, but I just 
looked at a glance, I think one of them was animated, but okay. I wasn't familiar with any of these. Okay. I definitely never watched them. For me, I have two, and they're 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 cult because they just didn't. People know about them, but they're not. They didn't break on through. Uh, one was uh, the Terminator Sarah Connor Chronicles, uh, making a movie out of that. I, and I'm not talking about, look, we have the Terminator franchise already mm -hmm. in the movies. Ter the Sarah Connor Chronicles was much different. It was actually more of a road trip movie where they were moving from, uh, and this starred uh, Lena Headey, who is now Queen Cersei on uh, Game of Thrones, she played Sarah Connor, and it was her and, and John Connor, and they were traveling around the country trying to avoid the Terminator. And it was not very, like, there was action, but it was not, it was very dialogue and character driven, much more like, like a Game of Thrones or an HBO show, and I kind of appreciate that. So I, I'm talking about making a movie version of that. Never gonna happen. Too confusing for the fans. Plus, as a TV show, it didn't do very well. But I would love to see that. It's got a pretty solid fan following. Though. Yeah. You, I, I agree with you. I think it's unlikely. But you never say never with something that kind of had, I guess, a degree of a cult mm -hmm. following. Something could spark. And and then one, I could see someday them making a made-for-TV movie. or Not made-for-TV, but like, like a Netflix or uh, Amazon kind of uh, funded type of thing, which is Fringe. Oh, okay. Uh, Sci-fi television series that it was kind of like X Files, but then mm -hmm. they kind of got into uh, some other storylines. Uh, I thought it was very well done. Uh, John Noble was in it. I thought he he was fantastic in it. If you don't know John Noble, he's in uh, Lord of the Rings. Um, he never got an uh, Emmy nomination, and I really felt like he deserved one. And there was uh, there was great acting all around in the storylines. The first season was kind of slow but they kind of started to get deeper into the mythology of it mm -hmm. and they had like alternate universes and all kinds of crazy stuff. I think it would be great on the big screen. I never watched much Fringe, but you that's, should yeah. check it out. The, the little bit I did watch, it would have been one of those things that I would have stuck with if I yeah. had time. <laughs> all right, we're moving on to the next question. We have uh, Raymond Velasquez and he writes, Hello Collider, my question is about nudity in film. Oh boy. Is nudity necessary in movies or even TV? Does it add or take away anything from the product? Or is it something that's just done when the rating allows it? Thank you and have a nice day. You can't just answer that question straightforward because the thing with nudity is either they use it well or they don't. Mm. It's either there just to be gratuitous and to be, oh, look at what we can do, or it's there because it enhances the story mm. and it enhances the characters. And that could be because that scene calls for a sexy vibe and mm. you want to have something like that. It could put someone in a more vulnerable position. I think there's just, you can't give a blanket mm. answer to that kind of question. You need to go through examples. And this has nothing to do with nudity in particular, but it was something that we were talking about on TV Talk last week and it's the rise of incest. <laughs> in film the and the TV. rise of incest but i mean really it wasn't until i was talking to grace and makuga and they were naming all these things out there that now include incest i'm like wow it it really is running rampant all over the, the place uh, the guillermo del toro movie uh what was that that came out like uh Two oh, years ago. Um, Crimson Peak. Crimson yeah. Peak. Yeah. Also, there, had. there you go. But my point, my point is, I don't want to reveal the show that I've been watching mm -hmm. that uses it well because it would be a spoiler for anybody who's not keeping up with it. But that show in particular uses it so well, where what they set up with the character and how they build that character throughout the earlier episodes of the season earns that big moment. And I'm not justifying her, her need for that. I don't mm -hmm. think it's right, but. There's a very real reason why she would want something like that. And mm. while I know it's wrong, I still felt for her and understand why she made that decision. And that, to me, is when you use something like that in the right way. Mm. And I, I guess the same could could be connected to the use of nudity in movies and TV as well. Yeah, I mean, I'm with you. I think the nudity thing is a case-by-case -case basis. And I think even within a show, you're talking about, let's say, Game of Thrones, I think sometimes they use nudity because it actually enhances and is part of the show. And sometimes it's gratuitous, right? So even within the same show, you can have both. In general, um, I find that, that actually, most of the time when I see non-nude scenes, especially during sex or after sex, 
it throws me off because it's just not believe. I mean, sorry, it's not believable. I don't, <laughs> anyone who's had sex knows that, like, you after you have sex, people don't like sit there with the covers up here and this they is walk. This totally around. sex ed collider yeah. style. <laughs> But I mean, anyone who had it knows, like, no one sits around, like, like immediately, like, puts on their clothes and, like, and so it throws me off, seriously. Like, so when I watch a, a TV show or a movie and then they're just, like, walking on fully clothed, it it kind of it kind of throws me off. Well, it's like in a PG-13 movie, whether you're talking about sex or violence and blood, it's like the second they cut away, your mind goes, oh, that's because they didn't have the rating. Yeah. Uh, but at least with the cutaway shot, it's like, you know, they're not like like having the character do something that wouldn't be natural. It's yeah. just more of a cutaway. Anyways, <laughs> so that's uh, my thoughts on nudity. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. You want to hear one really funny little anecdote? It's short and sweet. So in film school, again, I'm not going to name drop the person that gave us this note, but we were doing exercises where during the week and we would film a short scene mm. just to prep for bigger projects. and. There was one week where, for whatever reason, the assignment we were given did involve some sort of, like, not a sex scene, mm -hmm. but, like, a relationship scene. Mm -hmm. And the professor got so angry that so many people had their actors keep their socks on. <laughs> where, <laughs> it, like, forget the rest of your exercise and how you shot it, the dialogue, yeah. the delivery, all that. Every single time, he's like, nope, it's not believable, their socks are on. <laughs> I haven't thought about that yeah. in a while. <laughs> All right, now that we have uh, Collider Sex Ed 101 <laughs> done with, let's move on to the next one. We've got uh, Derek Spicer, and he writes, Hello, hey, Collider crew. After the drama with Lord and Miller and now Colin Trevorrow departing episode nine, I've come to the realization that Disney doesn't want directors. They want office managers. Kathleen Kennedy has shown repeatedly that Star Wars is her baby and her vision going forward, and people can either get on board or get out of the way. It's evidently clear they, they want to eliminate any director's personal touch in favor of the same Disney-esque style and tone throughout the Star Wars franchise. I think this approach is wrong and will eventually lead to disaster. It's like if an NFL owner hired a head coach but dictated to them what plays to call they will make during the game instead of letting the coach do his job. Why hire a director at all if the process is going to be completely producer slash studio led? What are your thoughts? Am I completely off base? Um, I think it might be a little unfair to word it this way because, yeah, Kathleen Kennedy is the president of Lucasfilm. And maybe that does mean when certain decisions get to that level, mm -hmm. she gets to decide whether it's yes or no. But I do hope that the operation there, and I can't imagine the operation there, is a complete dictatorship mm -hmm. where it's because... Not, no, nobody else cared, but Kathleen Kennedy decided to put her foot down in this situation mm -hmm. and say, I don't want that director because he's not doing what I want. I don't think that's how these things are playing out. And as much as I want to see them bring on great filmmakers that I admire because they have a specific style that I think makes them special, I do understand the other mindset, which is, we have this epic franchise that was set up a certain way, built a certain fandom. We need to keep what we're making now in line with that while still making it a little different so that we continue pushing mm -hmm. forward and we continue bringing in new viewers. And really, I know that there were troubles on Rogue One also, but to me, Rogue One was a great example of having that best of both worlds mm -hmm. where to me it did feel like a Star Wars movie, but it felt like a Star Wars war movie. and. That, f just for me personally, was just enough to kind of break the mold and do something a little different. With these situations, it's really unfortunate what happened with Han Solo. I'm not gonna lie, I'm very disappointed, and I, yeah, I'm a little concerned. With the Colin Trevorrow thing, yeah, I wanted to see this work out for him. I admired him as a filmmaker. I liked Book of Henry a little more than more people did, and I didn't think that that movie was such a big cause for alarm and for everybody to freak out and think he should be pulled from the project. But if this is the decision the president of Lucasfilm, with whatever team is around her, is going to make now this far in advance of production and release, unlike with the Han Solo movie, I'm gonna trust their judgment and just 
think in my mind right now, based on my limited knowledge of what goes on behind closed doors, that they are making this decision for the benefit of the movie and for the benefit of the franchise. Yeah, I think it's one of those things where I, I kind of understand where the question is coming from, but mm -hmm. I think it, things yeah. just aren't as black and white as that. Um, you can't say, like, she's not giving any you know, freedom to her directors and it's only what she wants because we're, we're, we're not there. Uh, and second of all, second of all uh, yes, there has been drama with, with the Han Solo spinoff movie. Yes, there's drama with episode nine. However, at this point, at least in my opinion, they're two for two. Force Awakens and Rogue One. Yeah. They, they're both good movies, at least in my mind. So, so far, maybe she's making the right decision. Maybe Lord... I, I love Lord and Miller. I love what the, all, all the things they've done. But maybe in this case, she's right. We don't know yet. So we have to see the final product and see if did it turn out for the best. Mm -hmm. Same with episode nine. Uh, yeah, I think giving directors or artists free reign to do whatever the hell they want is, is, is also a recipe for disaster. Just much like how he's talking about, I don't think uh, studio execs, producers, NFL owners should be micromanaging every little thing. They shouldn't be... You know, the notorious one is uh, was X Men Wolverine Origins or whatever, where they're like, "Oh, paint that thing red." Like that, those type of decisions. Like, hey, you, the producer really shouldn't be talking about what color a building is. Um, but they definitely ha should give some input, and I think mm -hmm. it's beneficial to give input and, and give notes. And and remember, this is you know billions of dollar franchise that needs to be maintained a certain tone and look. I mean. That's why, you know, when we're talking about suggested directors, you know, I'd love like someone like a Denis Villeneuve to step in. But Star Wars is not going to let that happen unless they know that he's going to, because his tone is a little darker, a little yeah. more, you know, like, so they wouldn't want him to come in there and bring everything that he brings, you know, like you're not going to see a Prisoners or Sicario-like Star Wars movie because they need it. Honestly, they need to sell toys. They need to kids to buy these things they're not you know so I understand your point but I do think uh, it's one a little premature to judge Kathleen Kennedy and two there needs to be some sort of checks and balances yeah I mean really what it all comes down to also is that one you can't really judge that we're gonna judge these movies when they're finished and really that's all that matters is that the finished product that we all get as fans is the best it possibly could be and also yeah we always look at the director mm. as the be all and end all that and and the director is responsible for so much they set the tone on set they set the tone for the film and all that but making a feature film is a joint creative yes. process even here when we work on sketches and let's say you're directing a sketch mm. you don't physically get on set directing that sketch until we've had so many creative meetings where mm. you're hearing input from so many different people and and ultimately certain decisions are your your decision but it's it is a, a joint creative yeah. process and really Kathleen Kennedy's role in that in my mind at least seems to be you know she she is steering the ship and making yeah. sure it stays the right way even while letting certain other people have a little fun and maybe do what they want so it's it's definitely you said it it's checks and balances it's yeah. about everybody working together to make sure that the the whole giant ship is heading in the right direction and, and, Kevin, and Kevin Feige is doing the same thing with yeah Marvel, exactly right? like he he doesn't want a director to come in and veer off what they've built and created. And, and I think Kathleen Kennedy's doing the They're same thing. They're also still figuring things out. It's like I compare it a little bit to the DCEU mm -hmm. where, you know, they had some things that didn't really work out. Then they had something that really worked out. And now they're making some changes to try to figure out what the what is going to be the best for that franchise with future films. And I think they're doing something similar because they had a little bit of a shakeup on Rogue One. They learned a lot from Rogue One and probably Force Awakens mm -hmm. too. And maybe right now they're trying to implement some of those things that they learned. And sometimes that requires changes. All right. So moving on to the next question, which is the one that you've been looking ha. forward to. Uh, <laughs> Vincente writes, what's up, Collider crew? Since it doesn't look too hopeful that the Power Rangers, the movie, will, will, won't get a sequel. Sorry, Perry. What do you guys think about a Netflix type of style series? I would love to see it done in a similar tone to the movie, and I think it gives them a better opportunity to recreate the green Ranger saga. So I'll, I'll, I'll go t talk about this first because okay. I know you have a lot to say. Okay. Um, I think that's a good idea except for I don't know if they can afford it budget wise. You know with the Power Rangers movie it was a much higher production value than the old TV series. Old that TV series 
they were there running around in suits and rubber suits and all that stuff. It was kind of had like a, you know, a, a kind of fun, you know, cheesy vibe to it. Where, where the new movie, which I enjoyed, where they took a more serious thing. You know, it was a little CW-ish, but you actually got into the characters, but then they also took seriously the suits and and the Zords and everything, and the Megazord and the, you know, so they actually put in production value into it. I just don't see a Netflix series doing that. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I just don't see anyone poning up the money for it. What are your if thoughts? If you're specifically gonna go after Netflix, I would say, ah, I don't know, mm -hmm. but I covered that Mortal Instruments movie mm -hmm. pretty heavily. And sometimes when you cover a movie a lot, you get even more excited than you would have been before. So I, I was so let down by that movie. And it's not a good movie. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was going to be the end of that series, no matter what, beyond the source material, mm -hmm. beyond the original books. Then all of a sudden, they announced a TV series of that. And I thought that was the dumbest idea. It was never going to work. It was going to be the same thing all over again. Apparently people like that show. Okay. So you know what? It could happen. I'm actually finally coming to terms with the fact that the sequel might not happen. Mm. Again though, I'm not gonna completely lose hope until I hear something official from Lionsgate because we've seen it before where movies don't do that well at the mm. box office. And, and admittedly, Power Rangers really didn't. The overseas didn't help it at all. Yeah. It did not make a lot of money. It has done well with toy sales. It has done well with DVD sales. You really, you never know what could come of that. And you don't know what Lionsgate execs are thinking mm. where, you know, we already put so much money into it. Maybe we should see the next thing through with a slightly lower budget just to see if we can bring in a bigger audience. So maybe they're thinking about it that way. I am not as hopeful that I'm going to get my Power Ranger sequel as I once was, but I don't think that a TV show is completely out of the realm of possibility. It, it would be expensive. It would mm -hmm. definitely be expensive, but I think there's ways to do it that you can keep the focus a little mm -hmm. more narrow. I mean, having those suits and having the Zords does make spending a good deal of money on effects inevitable. You can't really do it right nowadays mm -hmm. without having that, but there seem there there is ways to me where they can cut certain not cut corners that's probably the wrong way to put it but come up with with different storytelling tactics mm -hmm. to reduce the amount of that kind of stuff they need and i think it's really if so if this movie do, this movie didn't really succeed if this movie does not get a sequel if in a couple of years there is no power rangers tv show or nothing else down the line, I would like to bet that at some point in time, someone will bring back Power Rangers in some way, shape, or form. Because the truth of the matter is, this industry is obsessed with dipping back into things that were already proven successes, whether or not the thing that came out. I mean, really, look at all the franchises out there that had shitty installments, and they're still making oh, look, more look, of them. Look, yeah, look at the Dracula movie. They're going to make that Dracula is, movie. And like... The last one didn't do very well, and I don't know. That, maybe, maybe we'll get that R-rated Power Rangers movie first <laughs> that uh, Adi Shankar did, yeah, because yeah, yeah. I kind of like that, too. Uh, I would like to see the same cast yeah. come back. If they did a TV series, like, basically, it'd be like a sequel, but instead of a movie, it'd be the, the television series and use the same cast in there. And, you know, even the movie itself... They didn't go like, oh, action, 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 let's do a ton of CG in it. They actually built up the characters yeah. and a lot of stuff. So in a TV series, they could do that where they, they like it's mostly kind of drama and, and then maybe the last five minutes there's some sort of action that goes on in, that, in each episode. That was kind of what the uh, Mighty Morphin series was. It was mostly them, you know, fight. It was mostly them in being school. in school yeah. and interacting with each other. And the battles in the beginning were the putties, you mm -hmm. know, the guys that wore the, the gray yeah, yeah. suits. So, like, that was really easy to do. And then they would have the big Zord battle at the end. <laughs> so it could follow that same yeah. format. All right, let's move on to the last question. We have Ray Pate, and he writes, Hey, everyone, Collider Movie Talk from Dallas, Texas. Being that you guys live and run in the same circles as Hollywood and TV networks like entertainment channels A&E and Bravo, where they cover movies and the movie stars, but they don't do it in the same vein that you guys do. Do you guys think that this kind of coverage is overly vain and pointless? 
where no one is concerned about the movie quality or content, just who is dating who, what are they wearing, divorces, paydays, buying houses, kids, legal problems, drugs, problems, death, et cetera, et cetera. Why doesn't a movie talk style program happen on the so-called entertainment side of cable TV networks? Um, it doesn't happen because they don't do well, and I've been a part of two of them that have now been canceled. Oh, right. uh, yeah, one of, one of my first jobs out of undergrad was I was so, so lucky to fall into the opportunity to be able to work for the show Real Talk with mm. Jeffrey Lyons and Allison Bales, mm. and I loved that job. I was just so, so happy to mm. get up and go to work every day. I was so proud of the product that they were churning out, and really, I, I do credit Jeffrey, Allison, mm. and the producer, Mike Avila, for me being able to do what I'm able to do today, mm. but the problem was just no one watched it. It was a great show that had reviews, it had little news tidbits worked into it, it had interviews worked into it, and it got canceled, and that was the end of it. And then some of you guys know, I recently was doing episodes of Talking Pictures On Demand over at New York One in New York, and we used to do a great show, it was a great roundtable show about all the movies that were coming onto Time mm -hmm. Warner On Demand. So it's like, if you didn't know what to watch, you would watch us review a whole bunch of movies, and then you could decide, and that show went out too. So I think the problem is that we I, there's an audience for it on YouTube. There is not an audience for it on television. And really, even though I am not someone to watch things like these mm -hmm. these shows that cover, you know, who's wearing what and dating problems and drugs, that that just doesn't entertain me. At the same time, I. Do you like TMZ a mm -hmm. little? You ever watch their, I think it's a half hour show and they just go out and interview people? I don't like when they badger people because That's I find- That's why I don't watch it. I find that really off-putting, but every once in a while they'll catch someone in a good mood mm -hmm. and, and you'll get a funny answer, but I, I know people in my life who read tabloids mm -hmm. and, and they enjoy reading about this stuff and, you know, part of me thinks that it is unfortunate that that's part of the celebrity lifestyle when someone signs up to be a to be a movie star and be a really talented actor, maybe that is really into the craft, and then the inevitable part, inevitable part is that it comes with a significant amount of fame, and that means people follow them around with cameras, and that means people want to know all this stuff. Is that fair? It's it doesn't seem fair to me, but at the same time, there there's they go hand in hand. Mm. There's no removing it, and when that exists in this world, you're going to wind up with programs like this because people want to see them. Yeah, I mean, I personally like you. I'm not interested in these things. I don't, you know, really care who they're dating, gossip, et cetera, et cetera. However, there is a a part uh, of the viewing public that does enjoy this stuff. And I'm not even saying, oh, they're bad for enjoying this stuff. I personally not interested. They like that stuff, so those that program is for them. And and a and, and movie talk style program, I think, uh, yeah, it's, it's not on television because it wouldn't do well. And two, the, the more hardcore people that are into movies and TV are on the internet, internet. They want to go there, you know what I mean? They research there, they go to YouTube. That's where it is and that's why it, mm -hmm. it succeeds. You know, we do a, a movie talk show every day and, and you know, a lot of people watch and I, I just don't know if that would happen on, on television. Um, so I think it's better suited for the internet. And yeah. and I, I think that celebrity stuff is not gonna go away because there are people who are interested. There's people who, who like like movies and TV, but they don't like them the way that we like them, right? They like watching them, but then they're interested in the actors and yeah. their lives and all that stuff, and not they're not interested in the behind the scenes and in terms of like production and, yeah. and creative process. That's just not their thing. They they want to know other stuff. So and it's human nature. Yeah. It's human nature to admire an actor that you see in a movie that you love and to want to see them do interviews and to want to see them do silly things and to want to see candid photos of them shopping. I don't know. So. It, it does make sense, but what you bring up is right too, is that there's there's more of an audience on the internet. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about the stuff that we've been talking about recently with uh, every company out there starting up streaming services. It's because everybody that really, not everybody, but many people that really wanna watch this type of content and wanna see these movies, they're 
cutting cable services and they're starting to just have Apple TVs and streaming services and relying on their computers and YouTube and all that kind of stuff. So it, it does kind of make sense. Yeah, and, and also like for us, right? We, we just talked about it today. We've been talking about it last week. The whole uh, Colin Trevorrow not being part of episode nine anymore. That's huge for us, right? Yeah. Oh my God. Trust me, the casual movie fan has no clue that any of this stuff's going on. It's doesn't know who Colin Trevorrow, doesn't know who Kathleen Kennedy is. They know that a Star Wars movie is coming out this this it's December. Like, that's huge for us, and like someone getting a divorce is huge for another group exactly. of people. Exactly. So like to them, it's just it doesn't interest them at all. I'm telling you, if like you ask the average movie goer that that doesn't pay attention, they're not going to know any of this stuff. All they know about is oh, Star Wars has a new movie coming out. That's it. So that that's just the difference between people. Who, who watch our program and people like you and me who are very into the actual industry from a, like a yeah. more of a production standpoint. Just a different viewership. Yeah, yeah. All right, guys. Uh, thanks for joining us on this episode of Collider Mailbag. Uh, Perry, where can people find you? I am on Twitter and Instagram at PNMROF. Don't forget to check out yesterday is today's Today's at 2 p.m. Collider behind the scenes and bloopers. Um, it's it's gonna air then, and it's all about everybody's fear in honor of it. So it's really funny. It's got some Josh McCuga. You're gonna want to watch that. And you can find me on Twitter at Think Hero, Instagram Dennis.tzng. You can watch uh, Perry and Riley on tomorrow's uh, mailbag. Yep. And uh, also movie talk on Monday. We'll see you guys next time.